And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. She has a calm demeanor and a ready smile and is known for delivering talks which gives us much food for thought. Friends, please join me in welcoming our staff minister extraordinaire, Reverend Anne Schatt. Good morning, everyone. Let me add my own words of welcome. Welcome to a wonderful, warm <laughs> Sunday morning. And a very special welcome to those who join us Sunday after Sunday through the medium of the World Wide Web. This morning, I'm talking about consciousness. It's titled, A Matter of Consciousness. I want to take you back to the responsive reading, however, as the premise for the thoughts I wish to share with you this morning. At the bottom of page four of our program together, let us read the last two sets of sentences from I am a child of God. Together, I am a child of God, free and unlimited in my celebration of life. My declaration of inner dependence flows through me as I allow these words to become living truths within me. Gently and prayerfully, I repeat this personal declaration of inner dependence silently. I hold these truths to be self-evident. I am created free and equal, endowed by a loving creator with the inalienable rights of a fulfilling life the freedom of Christ-directed choices, and the experience of happiness every day of my life. The living truths of who and what we are and what we want our life to be are self-evident, products of our consciousness. The last time I spoke, I used the glossary of our Science of Mind text to give you the meaning for consciousness. This time I want to share Neville's thoughts on consciousness. Neville is a Barbadian, one of our new thought writers, and this is taken from his book, The Power of Awareness. He states, it is only by a change of consciousness, by actually changing your concept of yourself, that you can build more stately mansions, the manifestations of higher and higher concepts. By manifesting, is meant experiencing the results of these concepts in your world. It is of vital importance to understand clearly just what consciousness is. The reason lies in the fact that consciousness is the one and only reality. It is the first and only cause, substance of the phenomena of life. He goes on to say, health, wealth, beauty, and genius are not created they are only manifested by the arrangement of your mind. That is by your concept of yourself is all that you accept and consent to as true. What you can consent to can only be discovered by an uncritical observation of your reactions to life. Your reactions reveal where you live psychologically and where you live psychologically determines how you live here in the outer visible world. So your consciousness simply is concerned with what you accept and consent to, and they become the living truths within you. Jesus the Christ, the way show, in one of his parables, gives us another perspective on the evolution taking place within each one of us as we divine, define our experiences on our sacred spiritual journey on this plane of existence by the choice of what living truths we hold as self-evidence. Jonas Salk reminds us in his book, The Anatomy of Belief, the most meaningful activity in which a human being can be engaged in is one directly related to human evolution. This is true because human beings now play an active and critical role not only in the process of their own evolution, but in the survival and evolution of all living beings. Awareness of these places upon human beings a responsibility 
for their participation in and contribution to the process of evolution, end of quote. Therefore, this fulfilling life that we seek, the experience of happiness continuously, must come from our consciousness. The field of our experiences, our thoughts, beliefs, awareness, acceptance, and convictions. The parable of the soul, most of us remember in connection to four types of soil, which metaphysically translates into mental fields and the treatment of the seeds of truth and consequent absorption or embodiment. The parable goes like this. It's taken from Matthew 13, verses 3 and 8, and the subsequent explanation, verses 18 to 23. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. But he that receiveth the seed in stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and a nun with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by, he is offended. He also that receiveth seed among thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. He that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Dr. Irving Seal in his book, Learn to Live, gives a higher meaning of this parable as God or wisdom is like the soil, and he sows this world and all that is in it with the truths of life. They are continually falling upon our minds like grain upon a field. And the parable points out that they are, no, they are, that they are basically different types of mind. That interpretation we are accustomed to. But Joel Goldsmith in his book, The Contemplative Life, puts a whole new dimension as the types of soil are actually the phases of evolution we go through as we are exposed to the truths of life. Now exposure can come from external means or they can come from within as we access the universal intelligence. Therefore, the treatment of the seeds of living truths can be directly correlated to the phases of consciousness we go through as we grow and unfold in truth. To understand this, I will use material from the 12 phases of consciousness found in John Price's book, The Super Beings. The first type of soil, the barren wayside soil, which may be like the phase one consciousness. Here at phase one, the individual considers himself separate and apart from God, or his, his real identity are completely separate from any understanding of his or her relationship with any form of religious spiritual revelations and totally not interested in it either. Price describes it as a person who may or may not have an awareness of his true identity or if he does, it is only an assumption. There's no comprehension of the real meaning behind the revelation. He may have a strong self-image with its accompanying belief system, can on occasion pull himself up by his bootstraps and overcome hardships, handicaps, and achieve a degree of success through sheer sweat, strain, and personal willpower. 
Seal also adds the cynic, the skeptic, the dogmatist who have closed their minds and have nothing more to learn. Usually they are negatively inclined as a result of bad habits, training, environmental influences, limiting belief systems without any faith. If any idea of truth is given to them, usually they pick it apart, criticize it, destroy it, even their own concept of the idea. However, something happens. Here in Jamaica, the hard surfaced wayside exterior can be broken at any time by our service providers. <laughs> or simply, over time, the hard exterior wears down. We know that stagnation is not possible in the fluidic advance of life. This chink or break can be attributed to an exposure to something, whether a book, a set of religious tenets, something someone said or read to you, or a challenge to the normal routine of life experience, thus facilitating a movement in consciousness into the next phase. We move now to the rocky soil, or the next phase of consciousness. The individual has now started on a path of realization, examining various religious pursuits. Here, the understanding faculty is developing around an intellectual idea that there is a power within, another self on a higher vibrational level, a pattern of perfection that is the potential you, a higher nature that can be brought forth into expression. Still a theory, but there is much enthusiasm for reading, studying, and exploring the ideas. There is no interest in spiritual practices, including meditation, use of affirmations, visualization. Also, there is mind dynamics, workshops on self-actualization. The mind is beginning to open, and there is a fascination for results, the demonstrations. Evidence of living truths held in our consciousness are always, always showing up for manifestation. Now, remember some of the attributes of a stony soil. Some fell on places that had not much depth, sprung up, and when the sun came up, they were scorched and withered away. In this phase, we have the demonstrations, but when the challenges come, the mistake of the intellect emerges. The ego, false pride of not wanting to truly understand where we are in consciousness. How could this happen when I have been studying practicing, even if it is a few times a week. On the flip side, however, when we demonstrate, we go on the rooftop with it, or preach to our well-meaning friends, we know or have something that you don't, you know? <laughs> we have advice for everyone, and even attempt to convert everyone to our new way of thinking. Here, as the individual senses, though, a change in direction, it is usually best to keep one's counsel to oneself. No judgments and keep on practicing. Diligence here is the key to daily spiritual practices. Once this is being done, our spiritual muscles are being developed with our meditations, affirmations. And now refinement is actually taking place on the physiological, mental, and spiritual aspects of being. Remember, our growth and unfoldment is not like a step ladder of consciousness. But as we evolve, different attributes flow into manifestation into our external experiences depending on our alignment with principle. Sometimes there is no exterior evidence, but deep inside, we know when we are at one with that inner being inside. Pray unceasingly comes to mind as we take cognizance of the fact that as the clutter of belief patterns that are not in congruence with our spiritual development get released, challenges will result. But how we perceive them here is important. It is not a matter of complacency, because stuff happens. We understand them from the point of view that living truths are now being embodied in our consciousness, and the old ones 
have to go. It is here the approach to the cares of the world, including those of our family, close friends, depends on how we perceive them as part of growth and unfoldment and keep our mind stayed on the truth of being. It is here also that the, deceitful of rich, the deceitfulness of riches appears to distract us. The metaphysical meaning of the deceitfulness of riches is actually the feeling of separation from God, principle that may show up in the face of challenges. It is here we are tempted not to follow through with the consistency of our spiritual practices, keeping our minds saturated to understand what it means to embody principle and live from that standpoint. No matter what the issue is, whether our worldview, our home country's view, or individual issues, it is here we cannot afford to let anxieties, tensions sap our energy and reduce the efficiency of our instrument, the mind. To cognize what is true or not, or to interject with remembered true seeds that will set us free from the tyranny of our thoughts. It is here we ask ourselves, what in our lives is not working? What belief systems need to be released for us to heal, mature, evolve, forgive? We now observe what is working, what is breaking through, what are our peak experiences, our high performance capacities? What is inside of us that triggers circumstances, situations for us to operate at our highest and best? With this in mind, we can move on with our development spiritually, transform what needs to be transformed. Our spirituality, our creativity, our relationships with each other, our relationships with our professions, our spiritual home, Whatever it is, must be nurtured and encouraged. Circles are now formed that will provide an environment that will facilitate our growth and unfoldment into our full potential. We now commit ourselves to a higher state of being. We remember that we are inextricably linked to each other and to each individual's growth and unfoldment. We now become part of the social interrelationships and engagement that facilitate a higher quality of life for all. Our spiritual practices now become a way of life. We move in sacred circles of love. And as Price puts it in phase five, an individual consciousness is directed towards the good at least 50% of the time. Now the clouds seem to part and more sunshine comes into our lives. There's more stability, more order in our life's experience. Even in this phase, however, we have to continue to do the work as our shield of protection from the race consciousness, duality, is not strong enough yet to ward off the external negatives or even from our own mental states that may sabotage our new way of being. But with unwavering dedication to principle, and the use of spiritual practices, a definite commitment must be made. A covenant with our higher self. We now work towards self-mastery, the fertile soil that our beloved Weishua speaks of in the parable of the soul. It is here now there is the dying of the old consciousness and the new birth of our true identity and consciousness takes place. This consciousness now knows only spiritual man. We simply experience this joyful union with our loving creator. This is where what we are becoming becomes important. The core values, the living truths that are the center of our existence, now are the authority for our approach to self-mastery. It is our future in terms of the seeds of perfection sown within. It is the catalyst, the substance of being, or true reality as God-individualized expressions of light, love, and joy. Every word of truth, Joel Goldsmith states, that we read, every word of truth that we hear, every word of truth that we declare is a seed of truth. And the further we go in study and meditation, the more fertile our consciousness becomes, 
and the more these seeds will take root and bear fruit. Practitioner Carl Charlton last Tuesday now reminds us that this is a time when we cannot go back to sleep. We must now awaken to our spiritual magnificence in order that the world works for everyone. Dr. Sonia last Sunday stated, now we are in an infinite partnership with the Creator, full now of limitless potentialities. Our spiritual practices now become a way to worship, to live, and we enter them now with a joy that knew no bounds. I especially think of the silence. This practice is used in prayer power, one of our spiritual events on a Thursday evening. We enter this silence with no preconceived ideas, shopping lists, and not even as to how to be. We just sit still and listen. Joel Goldsmith, in his book, Awakening Mystical Consciousness, shares this with us. You sit back in a listening, attentive attitude, and know the word. The word will come to you. You may hear it within you as if you were hearing a voice. You may see a flash of light, or you may just get a feeling, a deep breath, and then a release as if a weight has dropped off your shoulder. We call that hearing the word, even though you have heard no audible word. But when you use the language of religion and scripture, you may indulge somewhat in poetic license when you say you hear the still small voice. It does not necessarily mean you're hearing anything, you know. Sometimes it's just a deep breath. A smile comes to your face and you wonder what you could have been troubled about. All appearances to the contrary just fade away and you are now released and set free from them. Friends, simply each one of us has to develop such an intimate relationship with our inner being that we each know when we are at one with it. Know without a shadow of a doubt, with absolute certainty that we are in the presence of the only power there is, and we are that power. As we continue to evolve into that state of a higher being, self-mastery, I close with these words from our text that our beloved Reverend Elma knows and recites. It's taken from page 517. I shall keep the promise that I have made to myself. I shall never again tell myself that I am poor, sick, weak, or unhappy. I shall not lie to myself anymore, but daily speak the truth to my inner soul, telling it that it is wonderful and marvelous, that it is one with the great cause of all life, truth, power, and action, until it breaks out into songs of joy with the realization of its limitless possibilities. May I read it again? I, I've, I'm becoming to learn it by heart because when she says it, her light comes onto our face. I shall keep the promise that I have made to myself. I shall never again tell myself that I am poor, sick, weak, or unhappy. I shall not lie 